Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Christine Chambers and I'm a psychologist here at the IWK Health Center. And I'd like to just welcome you to our series of talks uh, called uh, Psychology for You. And uh, it's our op an opportunity for us to uh, have a chance to interact with the public and provide some information about the various areas that we practice in here at the IWK. I also want to welcome our community uh, sites. We have individuals from Annie Ganesh, Kentville, New Glasgow, Sydney, Truro, Bridgewater, Middleton, and Yarmouth. And I understand uh, all of these sites, the roads are just as icy as they are here and are going to get icier. So uh, I appreciate uh, the, the attendance and uh, hope that you can all get home safe after the presentation. So I'm here today to talk to you about recurrent pains in children and because I'm a psychologist and this is a psychology series, I'll be uh, focusing primarily on psychological approaches for managing recurrent pains. Uh, in in addition to my uh, role as a psychologist here at the IWK, I'm an associate professor at Dalhousie. So in addition to seeing and working, children who ha with, working with children who have pain, we also do a lot of research on children with pain. And uh, our site here at the IWK is probably one of the leading sites in the world uh, for research on pain in children. We have a number of researchers doing um, work in the area. So I'm uh, happy to have the chance to uh, tell you a little bit more about this topic today. Sadly, recurrent pains are very common in childhood. Uh, a student and I did a survey a few years ago looking at just how common are recurrent pains in Canadian children. And this was a survey of a large sample of uh, Canadian children aged 12 and 13 years. And just as one example I'll pull out in terms of abdominal pain, we found that 35% of Canadian children, these are 12 to 13 year olds, report stomach aches at least once a month. 15% uh, reported stomach aches at least once a week, and 4% reported uh, stomach aches more than once a week. So this is very frequent, and the numbers look very similar for headache pain and uh, also for uh, muscle, joint, back pain as well. So we know that these types of pains are very, very common. Unfortunately, these pains have a very negative effect on children's lives. Uh, this was given to me by a 15-year-old patient of mine. This was several years ago in Vancouver, and she gave me her permission to uh, show this in presentations. And she wrote this when she was eight, and she found it in a drawer in her desk. And she said, my tummy hurts, my tummy hurts, what can I do? I've called the doctor, I've seen a specialist, and there's nothing that we can do. So I have this tummy problem that we cannot stop. My tummy hurts, my tummy hurts, what can I do? And I think this really summarizes for me the experience of children and their parents when there's pain in the family. It can be a very frustrating experience. Uh, unfortunately, children are sometimes told that the pain is all in their head uh, or they're not believed when they have pain. Uh, and that's probably one of the biggest obstacles to being a psychologist who works with children who have pain is that they assume that because the reason they've been referred to a psychologist is that it's all in their head. And so we have to do a lot of work around educating children about pain and educating health professionals as well. And so we'll be covering some of this today. So the purpose of my presentation is to provide an overview of recurrent pain in children, to give you an idea of what is pain and, and why is it that children have different types of pain. I also want to describe common psychological approaches to managing pain. Uh, I'm emphasizing psychological approaches because that's uh, my area of expertise. Medications and physical therapy and alternative therapies can play an important role in pain management as well. Uh, so usually psychological approaches, it's just one piece of the puzzle that we use in terms of pain management. Uh, I also want to give you an idea of some of the resources uh, available for children who have recurrent pain in their families. We actually have uh, quite a bit to offer uh, and ways that children can access psychological services. So what is pain? I typically think of pain, there's usually two types of pain. So one type of pain, which we're all familiar with, is acute pain. Uh, and in fact, Acute pain happens to us all the time when we stub our toe, uh, when we get a paper cut, when we have an infection or we break our arm, that's acute pain. So acute pain is a signal that there's some sort of tissue injury or inflammation or infection. So it's pain that serves a purpose. 
uh, it alerts you to the fact that you need to go see the doctor, that there might be something wrong. It, when you touch a hot stove, it's telling you, take your hand off that burner, you're going to you know, hurt yourself. There'll be tissue damage if you leave it there. So pain really does serve an important warning purpose. And so with the children I work with, I often describe pain as an alarm. It's an alarm that tells you something's wrong with your body. But this is acute pain. Chronic pain is different. Chronic pain may or may not be reflective of some under, underlying tissue damage or injury. So it can persist after an initial injury has healed. So chronic pain, unfortunately, doesn't serve that same alarm function. It doesn't mean the same thing as acute pain. Acute pain motivates you to seek help and to try to find the source of discomfort and solve it. Chronic pain, on the other hand, can go on without a clear contributor to the pain. We're going to talk a little bit more about what that means in a few moments. So there's many different types of chronic pain that individuals can experience. I generally think of them in two groups, the types of pain that are associated with disease or illness, so some clearly identifiable disease or illness. So things like sickle cell disease, which is an inherited blood disorder, or inflammatory bowel disease, which is inflammation of the intestinal tract, or juvenile arthritis, where there might be, there's inflammation in the joints. So these are all diseases that are identifiable and can contribute to pain. On the other hand, there's this whole category of, of conditions that we refer to as chronic pain conditions. And these types of conditions include things like headaches. Uh, there's also a very debilitating pain condition called complex regional pain syndrome, used to be called RSD. Uh, and that often develops as a result, um, develops following an injury, uh, results in really burning or stabbing pain in one of the extremities or both, uh, is often accompanied by swelling and uh, discoloration. Also childhood fibromyalgia, uh, which is widespread uh, pain in the muscles and ligaments uh, that's also associated with fatigue. Recurrent abdominal pain uh, is you know, a, a, a sort of a whole series of conditions where there's no metabolic or structural uh, abnormality. Uh, it's just pain that's occurring for some sort of functional reason. So in these chronic pain conditions, unlike those associated with disease and illness, the cause of the pain isn't quite clear. And we generally assume that there's some sort of disruption uh, in the pain signaling system of the body. This picture was drawn uh, by another of my patients who agreed to let me show this. And, and she drew this when I asked her, what does it feel like when you have pain? And this is an eight-year-old. And it's quite a horrifying picture if you look closely at it. Just the, the wide eyes and the tears and the, the mouth kind of all jagged and the, just saying, ah. So children often feel, and their families feel really, um, punished by the pain and really often caught up in it and unable to find a way to cope. So what are some of the negative effects of pain? Well, we know that pain is often related to anxiety and depression, even in children. When you have pain and you can't participate in activities, it can be frustrating, it can cause you anxiety, uh, it can lead you to feel sad and, and sometimes depressed. It also can limit your peer interaction. So when you have pain, you're not as likely to participate in things that your friends are doing. Uh, and children often miss out on these opportunities to form peers, uh, peer relationships. And certainly, what pain does is it interferes with the normal developmental track. As children are growing up, there are certain experiences that are normative that help them to develop friendships and confidence. And uh, pain can really disrupt that. Athletics. Uh, a lot of children with pain have to refrain from engaging in physical activities. And unfortunately, that has the negative effect of then leading to deconditioning. So when you, don't, when you aren't engaged physically, your body becomes deconditioned, and that can make your pain worse. So it can be a bit of a vicious cycle. Family relationships. The children that I work with who have pain, uh, their families are almost always very challenged and frustrated by how to respond. They don't know what the right thing to do is. They find it very stressful. And because pain can often lead to many doctor's appointments, uh, it can result in missed time from work. 
Uh, if you have a child who is staying home from school because of pain, sometimes that means that you're staying home from work because of pain. And there can be a real struggle that develops that sometimes can contribute to the pain as well. School attendance is probably the biggest issue, and we'll talk about this a little bit more um, towards the end of the presentation, but school attendance is problematic. I don't know how you all feel, but any time I ever missed school or skipped a class when I wasn't supposed to, it felt that much more intimidating to go back the next time. Not only do you have to face uh, your peers and perhaps their questions about why you weren't there, but you have extra schoolwork. You might have missed important academics and not be able to build on the skills. So school attendance is probably the biggest and first obstacle we have to deal with. That said, parents can play a big role in preventing school attendance from being problematic in kids with chronic or recurrent pain. Academic achievement. So as children miss school, uh, sometimes their grades start to suffer, and then that becomes a source of stress as well. And actually, another thing I should add to this list, the patient who I saw today reminded me of, the, of sleep disturbances and how pain and sleep uh, really can be very closely tied, and that when you have pain and it can interfere with your sleep, and when you're not sleeping well, it makes it harder to cope with pain, and it makes your pain feel worse. So some basic information about pain, without getting into too much of the, the, the technicalities. <laughs> pain perception is regulated by the brain. Right? You wouldn't feel pain if you didn't have a brain. When you touch something hot, it sends a signal to your brain. This is a, it's not a one-to-one -one ratio, so if I was to get a paper cut and you were to get the same paper cut from the same source that's the same depth, our pain is different. And that's what makes pain a very interesting thing, is that pain is subjective, it's private. Everyone's experience is different. And, uh, you know, if you talk to individuals who've had the same type of surgery, they'll talk about very different pain experiences. Good example is, is uh, labor and delivery. Everyone has a different story or a different threshold for pain. Pain is subjective, it's private. And it's very difficult to know what someone else's pain really is. I emphasize that all pain is physical and psychological. Whenever I tell someone what I do, I work with children in pain, they say, oh, like psychological pain or physical pain? And we say, no, it's, it's the same thing. All pain, even surgical pain, where you have a clear source of discomfort, emotional factors play a role. We know, research has shown time and time again, that feelings and thoughts can increase or decrease pain. And in fact, a lot of the new imaging research shows that the areas of the brain that control different emotions are closely related to pain uh, and, and pain experiences. So we know that f the thoughts, feelings, and the experiences we have in our body are all related. We also know that memories can affect pain. Children who have had, say, a, a particularly nev negative experience around pain, that negative experience can make children vulnerable to experiencing more pain in the future. Interestingly enough, we're all born. Our body has this natural pain control system. Uh, and unfortunately, chronic pain can really disrupt that system. And I like to think of chronic pain as what happens when your body, or when what happens in your body is similar to, to what happens if you were a car that never got a tune-up. You know, things start to get bogged down and they don't work quite as effectively. And so a lot of the treatments that we do with children are kind of like tune-ups in terms of giving your pain control system a tune-up. Uh, it's turning down the volume. Sometimes our pain systems are too loud. And so helping children to learn ways to turn the volume down on their pain. We do know that pain can be controlled. I haven't said that pain can be eliminated, because that's something we can never promise. And I wish I did have a magic wand, and I tell this to my patients, I wish I had a magic wand to make your pain better. But unfortunately, we can't always deliver that. It's, it's a goal, but we want to control the pain so that it doesn't interfere with your day-to-day -day activities, that it doesn't keep you from school, that it doesn't keep you from doing the things that you want to do. Unfortunately, we know that children are often undertreated for pain. Uh, there's lots of studies, and unfortunately, it's still continue to this day, that show that when children undergo the same types of surgeries as adults, they're prescribed and administered significantly less pain medication than adults. 
there tends to be a lot of concern about giving pain medications to parents and or pain medications to children by parents, concerns about addiction, concerns about tolerance. But uh, in, all, in most cases, these concerns aren't warranted. And so sometimes children's pain isn't believed and they're not treated. So our assumption is if your child says she or he is in pain, she or he is. That doesn't mean that they can make choices that are going to have a negative effect on their life, but we generally validate the pain experience. And the job is really to work together with your child's physician or other members of your team to understand factors that contribute to your child's pain. So if the pain is a Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. tummy ache, well, there are factors contributing to that. Let's figure out what they are and address the factors. Uh, so some of the ways that we address the factors are through the use of medications, thoughts and feelings, changing their environment, which is when we're working with parents, parents can be very helpful at making changes. They're not always easy changes, but changes that will help the child in the long term. Physical strategies and lots of other approaches as well. Um, acupuncture is something that receives a lot of attention. We just published a study looking at yoga. Uh, so there are many different factors that are many different treatments that can be used to target problematic factors. But you really have to think about what is the issue for your particular child? What are the factors that are contributing to your child's pain? What contributes to one child's pain may not contribute to another's. So how do you figure out how much pain your child is in? As I mentioned, pain is subjective, it's private. No one else can really ever know someone's pain. Uh, there are ways that we can cr kind of get an estimation. Uh, the easiest way to get that is looking at what your child says. Uh, and uh, we'll give you some tools uh, or show you some tools that you can use in a moment. You also need to look at how your child behaves or acts and also how their body's reacting. So some people when they have pain there is a really strong physiological response. Uh, other times there, there isn't. I've worked with children who indicate that their pain is an 8 out of 10 in the moment but actually seem to be functioning quite well. Uh, and I don't challenge that. Uh, challenging someone about their pain and saying, oh I don't think you really have an 8, that really doesn't get us anywhere. Uh, but rather focusing on what we can do to decrease the pain. And again, my 8 might be your 2. Uh, it's all relative. The easiest way to get a quick estimation of your child's pain is using just a number scale. Uh, so asking them to rate from 0 to 5 or 0 to 10, uh, which we tend to prefer, how much pain they have. Of course, this depends how old your child is and what their senses of, of uh, what their number skills are. But most children are able to do this pretty easily. In research, and sometimes here in the hospital at the IWK, we have a variety of other different tools that we can use. Uh, poker chips, where you say this is a little bit of pain, this is a lot of pain. Uh, a slider scales, faces scales, the oucher, uh, the faces scale at the bottom there can be downloaded free of charge from the internet. Uh, so these are all resources that you can use. But practically what's the easiest is just having them rate their pain. And this can be really helpful when you're trying to figure out what factors contribute to pain. By getting pain ratings, uh, you can get a sense of what the pattern is. Now, of course, we'll talk about this in a bit. Sometimes talking too much about pain is a bad thing. Uh, and certainly we don't want the emphasis to be on pain all the time and constantly asking children for pain ratings. But in the sort of detective phase where we're trying to figure out the factors, getting pain ratings can be very helpful. Uh, here in the hospital, we often use body outlines. Sometimes children will give them crayons to color. A different color crayons might represent different intensities of pain. Okay? So this just helps us to get a sense of where the pain is and intensity of the pain. We usually have our children in the beginning uh, do some self-monitoring or filling out pain diaries. And they're very basic, and you can easily do this at home as well. But having a diary where you write the time and the date, uh, the setting where the child was when they had pain, what they were doing, uh, the location of the pain, intensity. Well, here's 0 to 100 we might use with the teenager, or 0 to 10 for a younger child, and how long the pain lasted. Sometimes you can add on like what helped, what didn't help. How are you feeling at the time? So to get a sense of what the patterns are. And inevitably, whenever I meet with families and I ask to identify a pattern or factors, they'll say there's nothing. There's nothing there, there's nothing there. And then when they go away for a week and complete this, this type of, 
of diary sheet and they come back, they start to see the pattern. When you're living it in the moment, it's really hard to be objective. But when you get it on paper and have someone else take a look, often you can find the patterns. Uh, and sometimes we have children, if they, you know, if gym is a problem for them and it's only every couple days, well, is this happening on gym days? Uh, is it when there's a spelling test? Is it uh, when they've had a certain type of food? Uh, so this can really be helpful and you can track the factors that you think are going to be helpful to you. In psychology, we refer to uh, an approach called the cognitive behavioral approach. And the cognitive piece refers to what you know, believe, um, feel, or say to yourself. So it kind of focuses on our, our thinking and our feeling. The behavioral piece, on the other hand, is what we learn by observation of others um, or by reward and punishment. So the psychological approaches that we use in pain management focus on cognitive factors, so the things that kids say to themselves or feel, as well as behavioral things, so what they might be learning through their environment, either through reward or punishment or just observing others. So we really try to target both of these factors in a pain management plan. There's a whole bunch of approaches that fall under the classification of cognitive behavioral, and we're going to talk about some of these today. But essentially what happens is when, a, when we meet with your child, we review all the factors that seem to be playing a role and choose the approaches that seem to be the best match for them. Some children really do well with certain types of strategies and they'll come in and say that really helped every time I had a stomach ache I tried that and it worked and other kids come in and say that was stupid that didn't work at all and so we try something else so some of these things are, are distraction and we're going to go through these in detail uh, cognitive coping skills we'll explain what that is in a minute Im imagery one of the wonderful things about working with kids and I've worked with both children and adolescents with pain and adults is that we can really use their imaginations to their advantage. And that's a really effective and fun thing to do with kids. Uh, breathing exercises, relaxation, modeling, uh, so showing people, or sort of showing by our own behavior coping. Uh, behavioral rehearsal, so practicing things. Reinforcement, so receiving praise for trying, uh, and also involving the parents. Research has shown time and time again that when parents are actively involved in the treatment program, uh, children do better and they're more likely to, to be doing better in the long term. So parental involvement is key. I sometimes have families come and drop their kids off their, for their appointment and think that we can do the fixing and send the kid home all fixed up and that's not how it works. So parental involvement, we're all on the same team. So what do we mean by distraction? Well, distraction, it seems very simple, is just taking attention away from pain. Unfortunately, uh, many individuals, when they experience a somatic symptom or some bodily symptom, they tend to focus a lot of attention on it. So, and you know, people vary in their, in their sort of predisposition to do this. But we know that the more you focus on pain, the more you think about it, the worse it gets. You might think of when you've had an injury and you distract yourself, you feel better. Uh, certainly some people report, you know, if you're engaged in an activity uh, and you're really concentrating and focused, you may not even realize you've hurt yourself until afterwards and you look down and you say, oh my goodness, and this happens in sports a lot and that's an example I use with kids where, you know, they're in the soccer game, they fall down, they have an injury, but they don't realize that they keep going and it's not till the game's over that they realize, I think I really hurt my leg. Uh, and that's that's distraction and that's also your body kind of uh, working to keep you in the moment. So we take attention away from the pain and focus on another activity. Unfortunately, when children have pain, there can be a lot of discussion around the pain. And certainly, as we discussed in the beginning, the, the alarm function, when that acute pain is happening, you want to ask about it. You want to follow up. You want to decide, do we take you to eMERGE? Do we take you to the doctor? Do we refer you to a gastroenterologist or a rheumatologist? So there is a lot of discussion about pain. The doctors will ask you lots of questions about pain. And that's all very helpful in that acute phase or the sort of detective phase. But once the doctors have ruled out major contributors, medical contributors to the pain, then it's not so helpful to continually focus on the pain. By focusing on the pain, you, it may be the only thing you're thinking about, and that can be unhealthy. So helping children to figure out what they can do when they have pain. 
This is a worksheet that uh, one of the children that I worked with really enjoyed. And it was just some things to do when you feel a headache starting. So take some deep breaths. Breathe out and relax. Uh, think of your favorite place. Uh, your favorite activity. So whether it's playing music um, or going outside for a walk. Finding other things to think about. So I've had children who say, it helps if I practice my multiplication tables. And that doesn't sound like a very fun strategy for me, but it worked for that particular child. Uh, silly things like smiling to yourself or trying to think more positively. So again, distraction, finding activities that are engaging, that are going to take the attention away from the pain. And this can be really individualized. You can sit down with your child and say, Let's come up with a list of 10 things that you could do when you have pain instead of thinking about the pain. You know, it's cuddle your dog or read a good book or call a friend. One of the most basic skills that we can teach kids is deep breathing. And it sounds very simple, um, but there are, you know, three basic steps in helping kids to Rest their hands on their stomach, and when you take a deep breath, you want your stomach to inflate. So you don't want to be breathing from up here. This is where we all usually breathe from because it's really efficient um, and uh, quick, but it's not very relaxing. So encouraging children to take belly breaths and breathing in as much as they can and then breathing out the air and really paying attention to that, breathing in and breathing out and closing your eyes and then slowly um, slowly kind of getting the breathing down to a manageable pace. And this is very quick and easy. We have often little cards that we'll give kids to remind them that they might put in their school bag. And we have kids practice in session with us. We teach them how to do it to make sure they're doing it correctly. We have kids teach their parents. Um, and then they go home and practice. And they try to remember to use this strategy in different situations. And that's where parents can be really helpful in reminding or cueing kids. Have you, did you try your deep breathing? Or you have a tummy pain? Well, why don't you try the deep breathing that you learned? So that's a very simple strategy. It can be used anywhere. Uh, and some children find it really helpful. And again, it's calming the body down. Another type of relaxation strategy is called uh, progressive muscle relaxation. And there's different ways we teach this to children of different ages. But essentially what you do is you ask children to tense various muscle groups, so to squeeze their hands as hard as they can, and then to relax them. And really helping children to notice the difference between the tension and the relaxation. And by forcing the tension and then allowing the, sort of the relaxation really helps children to calm their body and their muscles down. And I find this is sometimes very helpful with children who have muscle pain because they don't realize that they're getting really tight uh, and their bodies are really you know, very strained. And by forcing the tightening and the relaxing really helps. So some of the different muscle groups, um, squeezing toes, uh, pointing toes forward, stretching out your legs, clenching your fists, uh, bending elbows and tensing biceps, scrunching up your shoulders, and squeezing and tightening so all of them together. And uh, there are fun ways that we can do this with kids. So, you know, for scrunching up your shoulders, we talk about them being a turtle. Um, and there's all kinds of images that you can use to encourage them. Uh, you know, with the toes, imagine that you're smushing your toes down in mud and then relaxing them. And a lot of kids that I work with find that there's a particular muscle group that's helpful to them, like the shoulders, for example, based on their type of pain. And they might just do that one particular um, muscle uh, tension and relaxation, and it helps. So again, may not work for every child, but we try these different types of things based on what they think might be helpful. And some children who are quite skeptical walk away, and then they come back and say, that really worked for me. Another approach to relaxation is imagery. And again, using children's imaginations to their advantage. Uh, so we might work, usually when we're seeing children individually, we'll try to come up with a, an image for them. So asking them what their favorite place is, uh, or what their favorite color is, or a relaxing place where they, can, where they can go when they have pain. And then you would just say something like, I want you to close your eyes and picture yourself at the beach. And to personalize this for a child, we'd say, what is it that you like about the beach? Do you like the sound of the waves? Do you like the feeling of the sand? And really try to recreate that for them. And 
Often we'll use audio tapes uh, that the kids can take home uh, or they'll bring in their digital recorders and we'll record it for them so that they can listen to it at home, maybe right before bed or when they have pain. Um, and they can just be personalized so it feels really good for them. Another strategy related to imagery is the idea of having a wave of color rush through your body slowly. And as the color sort of rushes through your body, it, it, um, the pain in the different body parts disappears. So using the power of kids' imaginations, you just think of what they do with their imaginations in play. Um, and using that to help them uh, is wonderful. Other kids who, who do well with imagery-related tasks really like things like the switch trick. Um, and this is true, you know, our, our, our brain does have switches. Uh, and you can help to control your discomfort by turning off the switches. And so having children, sometimes we have them draw what their pain switch looks like. And, you know, have them really personalize what it, what it looks like, what it feels like. And kids come up with these really funky designs or it just looks like a plain light switch from the kitchen. Um, and then having them slowly imagine just turning the pain switch off. Same with the volume. Some children will draw, you know, CD players or radios and imagine turning the volume off. Again, using imagination and being creative. You all know your children best, uh, and you're the experts on your children. And so often parents will give really important you know, clues or ideas about what will work for each individual child. Um, other approaches that sometimes we even use with needle-related pain that relate to this imagery is imagining that they're putting on a magic glove. So if they're having to have blood work, for example, uh, and saying you're putting on your magic glove, and this magic glove you know, tries to keep the pain away. Uh, and that's a really powerful technique that we use quite a bit with children who have acute pain. Unfortunately, when you experience pain, there's often a big fear component that comes with the pain. So children become fearful that the pain will come back. Uh, and there's a lot of what we call in psychology negative self-talk. So these statements that I'll bring up are statements that I hear from children with pain all the time. So, you know, I can't stand it anymore. I hate this. Nothing helps, so why should I bother trying? I give up. So these are all thoughts that children have. And of course, when you're th we know there are links between thoughts and feelings and how our body reacts. And so children who are thinking this way, it's not going to make you feel very good. And that can, in turn, have an impact on your pain. So helping children to identify what their negative talk is. And usually with children, there's sort of one or two things that they often repeat them to themselves. You know, it's coming back, or I'm, I'm, not, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna miss soccer, or I'm not gonna be able to go to dance. So these kinds of thoughts. So we often have children, we draw a picture of themselves, or give them a, a body outline with, with these, you know, empty thought bubbles. And then have children write in what their thoughts are. Um, and sometimes they need a little help to be able to identify these. And then what we do is we go through each one and say, okay, so I can't stand it anymore. Well, when you say that, that can't make you feel very good. What, do we, what can we do? Uh, what can we say that's different from that? And reword it more positively. So negative self-talk becomes positive self-talk. So I can handle this. Uh, I've handled pain like this before, and I can do it again. It'll be over soon. Or every time I practice managing my pain, I get a little better at it. So helping children realize that we can change the thoughts, and it feels a bit artificial at first. It doesn't feel natural, and children are kind of writing out the positive and saying, whatever. But it's sort of training kids to help identify these negative thoughts and replace them with a positive one. Uh, that, that in and of itself can be very helpful. In psychology, and you as parents or anyone who's worked with children knows about something called positive reinforcement. And that is that behavior that's rewarded is likely to be repeated, okay? So if you reward a child for doing something, then they will likely repeat it. Unfortunately, this rule applies to both positive behaviors and negative behaviors. So inadvertently, sometimes we often provide rewards for behaviors that we don't want repeated. 
So a really good example is providing special treats or snacks or extra attention when in pain. And certainly my mom was wonderful at doing this. I loved staying homesick from school. I got absolute star treatment. I got to watch TV from the sofa, all of my favorite snacks, um, and lots of extra attention and activities. And certainly when your child is acutely ill, they have a fever, special attention is needed. Unfortunately, this can begin to become a lot more exciting than going to school. And even negative attention sometimes can be positive for children. So even if it is talking about pain a lot, uh, that in itself can reward the behavior. So this is very well intentioned, and parents often feel really badly when they get into this cycle, but that's the natural response at first. Of course, your child is in pain and is distressed, and you need to respond. But we need to figure out when to draw the line. And we also need to figure out, is this, is this contributing, perhaps, to part of the problem? A concept that parents aren't always as familiar with with is something called negative reinforcement, which in my work with children who have pain is even more powerful than positive reinforcement in contributing to difficulties with pain. And negative reinforcement is behavior that results in escape from something unpleasant is likely to be repeated. So if you engage in a behavior that results in escaping from something unpleasant, you're likely to repeat it. And what is something unpleasant for children most of the time? School. <laughs> so this is where staying home from school can become problematic. And again, it's a well-intentioned approach, right? When we know that when our children aren't feeling well, we need to tend to them to figure out what the problem is and then to, to uh, you know, resolve it, and then they can go back to school. Unfortunately, with recurrent pains, uh, this can feed, feed, you know, feed into the problem and really fuel the fire. So when we allow children to stay home from school, uh, this then is it's an escape from perhaps negative things that are happening at school. And even if there aren't negative things happening at school, the stress of missing school uh, adds to the burden of the pain. And it's not uncommon for me to work with families uh, whose children have been out of school for a whole month. Uh, and that is a really tough thing to get back going to. Um, but once you start along that road, it can be very, um, you can easily end up there. And, and parents who are in this situation uh, often feel very badly about it, and it becomes an impossible um, thing to resolve on your own, and you really need some help to get them back in there. So. Our goals for pain management, our hope is always to work with families to reduce or eliminate pain. Okay, that is always our goal. But unfortunately, pain is often a long-term problem. Most of the kids that I've met have had belly pain for years or have struggled with pain as a result of a disease for a long time. And long-term problems often need long-term solutions. And that's where psychological approaches can be very helpful because these are skills that you can learn that can help in the long run, not just the short run. I've had uh, many patients who uh, often report, well, you know those things you taught me a few years ago? Well, I'm using them when I get nervous about taking exams now in high school. Uh, so all of these strategies and skills, they help with pain, but they also help with life. Uh, and I often think we would all have benefited as a child from learning these types of things. So again, we hope to work with, with families to reduce or eliminate pain. That's always the goal. But our focus is also to eliminate the negative impact of pain on children's lives. Uh, so whether it be anxiety and depression, uh, social limitations, and school absence. And it's interesting, today I met with a patient of mine from two and a half years ago. And she, her mom had called and said, would it be all right if she came in to see you? She wants to update you on a few things. And I said, sure. And this was a child who'd been out of school for two months when I met her um, and was really struggling and had to give up all the activities she enjoyed, including dance, and really was in a bad place, was very discouraged, never thought it would get better. And she, her pain was pretty much always an eight or nine out of 10. And uh, in fact, she had missed so much school that they didn't even have a desk for her in the classroom anymore. And here she, here she is two and a half years later, after working with our pain team, after working with me and learning psychological approaches, her pain is, is uh, still a two. 
Um, but for her, that's a manageable amount of pain. And it was in, I hadn't seen her in a year, and she uh, brings in her duffel bag of all the things she wanted to show me, while I, that things that happened while I was on my maternity leave, including her driver's license, pictures from her grade 9 prom, pictures of her boyfriend, what else was there? Oh, her point shoes from ballet. That was a major goal for her. She thought she'd have to give it up altogether. And interestingly, if she said to me, I said, how are you feeling about your, your 2 out of 10? And she said, you know what? It's a reminder. And I said, what do you mean? She said, if I didn't have any pain at all, maybe I'd forget where I'd been. And she said, but that little bit of pain kind of keeps me remembering how I could really have lost a lot and not had these opportunities. Uh, so it's a good example of, of someone who was able to really turn things around. And she, I asked her, what would you tell me to tell families? And she said to really trust. She said, when I first came to see you and you said I had to get back to school, I never wanted to see you again, and I really didn't believe you were right. But often we don't see improvements on children until children start to get back to their activities. You know, the less you do, the less you feel like doing. But when you get back into life and you're doing the things that you fear, uh, often that's when the improvements in pain come. So we have recommendations for parents, uh, and these involve certain things like limiting or removing attention from pain. Sometimes pain can become a major focus for families. It's the first thing that's discussed in the morning. How are you feeling today? Are you okay to go to school? Um, and so we try to really limit that. It's not accomplishing anything. And it's not that you want to ignore your child. Uh, you want to say, you know, I hear you. You're not feeling well today. Or you have pain. Um, you know, what else is going on today? We're refocusing the discussion. It's really critical that you be sure that your child goes to school each day. And many parents say this is a heck of a lot easier said than done. Uh, and that's, if you're having trouble with that, psychologists can play a really important role in a relatively short period at developing a plan that's manageable. Uh, I never, you know, when I have a child come to me who's been out of school, uh, we never say, okay, you're back at school tomorrow have fun. You know, that's not how we do it. We come up with a very systematic plan. We often work with the school uh, to try to deal with it. But ultimately, uh, the rule that we use is if you don't have a fever, uh, if you're not vomiting, you know, you don't have diarrhea, you go to school. Right? Pain is unfortunate, but children need to learn that they have to go on even when they do have pain. Okay? And so, again, the odd missed day of school due to illness is fine, but when it starts to become a pattern, uh, that's when we need to intervene. And, uh, you know, this is one of the things that psychologists can really be helpful to you with. Children sometimes have a really hard time identifying stress, either at home or at school. Uh, often in young children, it does come out as tummy aches. Uh, my tummy hurts. I don't feel right. Uh, and so helping to figure out is there something going on at school? Sometimes you have to talk to teachers uh, to get a sense of, you know, is, this, is there a learning you know, issue going on here that maybe we need to investigate further? Some of the children who I've worked with who have pain, uh, one contributing factor is that they, their vision was impaired and they weren't seeing things correctly. And so the stress of that was making their pain a lot worse. So really helping to try to tease apart what's going on here. You know, if it's always every Tuesday, what's going on at school that makes your pain worse on Tuesdays? Uh, stress is a concept that we as adults are very familiar with. Children experience it too, but they don't have the same words or experience to reflect on it. Another thing is providing attention and special activities on days when your child doesn't have headaches. Uh, and the reverse of this is, well, or whatever type of pain they're experiencing. When children stay home and they're sick, um, when, you're, when you're too sick to go to school, you're too sick to do a lot of your fun activities. Like often the children I talk to when I ask them, well, what do you do all day when you're home? Well, I'm on the computer, I'm playing video games, and I'm like, well, that sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, if you're too sick to go to school, you're too sick to have fun. Um, and that sounds really mean, but staying home from school shouldn't be fun. And you can think about the times when you've been sick enough to stay home from work, for example. Uh, you're not enjoying it. Uh, it's not 
not fun. Uh, and so doing what we can to make sure that it's not fun. And that doesn't mean that you don't treat your child with respect and acknowledgement and that you're managing their symptoms. You know, if they have strep throat, you need to deal with that. But it's for these complaints that, that aren't linked to an acute illness that we don't want to make sure, we want to make sure we're not giving lots of attention. And giving that kind of attention on days when there isn't pain. So again, limiting activities and interactions on sick days. And also encouraging your child to practice the strategies that they have for pain management. So this is where giving them some tools for their toolkit that they can use uh, to manage pain. Uh, and that's a really helpful thing when you've t worked with your child and they have a few things they can try. When they say they have pain, instead of being like, well, what do I do? Or tell me more about the pain, you can just say, well, you know what? Uh, why don't you try this? And go see if it works. So does all this stuff work? There's a lot of research on the efficacy of psychological approaches for pain management. And it's very convincing data. We know that these strategies do work on their own or in conjunction with medication. Some studies show for different types of pain, such as recurrent abdominal pain, that medications actually aren't effective and psychological strategies are much more effective. And again, as I mentioned, these are all good life skills. Uh, being able to manage stress that might make pain worse, all of these techniques can help in other situations. Unfortunately, few families are able to access these kinds of specialized psychological services, and that becomes a real problem. Uh, and an, a lot of the time, it's just due to lack of awareness. So, you know, psychologists don't have the same kind of, uh, you know, marketing budget as Tylenol, for example. And so you don't see commercials where, you know, psychologists are, are bragging about all the things that we can do to help kids. And that's partly why we decided to form this lecture series, to share our knowledge with the public. Uh, and there are resources here at the IWK, as well as psychologists in private practice who can be very helpful. It's one of my favorite cartoons, so they're in a surgical unit here, and the, the caption is, well, I guess that explains the abdominal pains, and they're hauling out a porcupine. Mm -hmm. And I think that everyone who has pain wishes that there was this answer and solution. And unfortunately, there most of the time isn't. Abdominal pain is one example. 90 to 95% of kids who have abdominal pain do not have some underlying disease or illness that uh, is clearly causing the pain. And I think, you know, most of the families that I work with, a really important change is to move from trying to find out what's causing the pain to moving towards what we can do to help cope with the pain. I think. People look for the cause because they think if there's a cause or a particular disease that they can give it a label, that there'll be a solution that comes with it, that there's a pill that goes along with that label. And even when there is a condition such as arthritis or sickle cell disease, where you can really identify sort of biologically what's going on, there often isn't a quick fix for the pain. Most of the time there isn't. So, Understanding that pain is really complex, but that said, there's lots of different ways that we can go about addressing the pain. So what kind of services are out there for children who have pain? One of the services here at the IWK is the Complex Pain Team, and it's an interdisciplinary team, so that means there's individuals from different backgrounds who all work together. Uh, so it can be a little bit intimidating for families to enter a room with an anesthesiologist and a nurse and a psychologist and a physiotherapist all there. But one of the challenging things about pain, particularly chronic pain that's gone on for a very long time and is very disruptive to children's um, lives, is that you meet with so many different people and each person has a different part of the story and they're not all on the same page and it's very confusing. You might get conflicting advice like one doctor says, well, why don't you try this? And the other doctor says, well, well you know, I don't think you should do that. You should do this. Uh, here you get everyone in the same room at the same time uh, and it can be a very helpful approach. Uh, and referrals for this approach um, go to Dr. Alan Finley, who's the director of uh, pain services here at the IWK uh, in anesthesia. And typically this, this service works with children uh, who you know, really need a full team approach whose pain has not been able to be managed, you know, with psychological approaches alone, for example, or medical approaches. 
We also have assistance with coping. This is the service that I'm a part of at the IWK, the Pediatric Health Psychology Service. We see a lot of children with recurrent abdominal pain, a lot of children who have um, uh, you know, diseases such as um, arthritis or cancer who need assistance with coping. Uh, and this is our main emphasis here. And unfortunately, there's a lot more children. We're a center-wide service. We get referrals from across the hospital, uh, all the different outpatient clinics. We also do inpatient work. We have a colleague, Mark Blumberg, who works specifically in oncology. But there's a lot more kids who need our help than we ever get referred. And I think one of the reasons why we don't get as many referrals as I think we should is that sometimes the pediatricians are scared to suggest a psychology referral to families. That they think somehow by suggesting um, the psychologist that they're going to really put families off and that they're going to uh, somehow you know be concluding that the pain is psychological and that really I, I think unfortunately uh, feeds into it sometimes and our, our, I certainly I work very closely with our gastroenterologists and they are very very good at letting people know and asking their permission so, okay we make a referral to psychology it doesn't mean that we think the pain is in your head but it's that we know that there are ways that the psychologist can help you while we're working on this from a medical perspective uh, so I know that there are lots of kids out there who could benefit um, and uh, we also take some referrals from community pediatricians as well so if you're in the situation and, and you want help, ask for the referral. There are also psychologists in private practice in the community who have expertise in working with children and adolescents in the context of pain. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, a psychologist in private practice is an expensive route. Um, they vary in terms of hourly rate, but usually anywhere from 100 to say $150 an hour. However, most extended health plans have Blue Cross or Manulife have coverage for $500 to $1,000 a year of psychological services. Uh, and and usually, you know, we can work very effectively with children in about three to five sessions, uh, sometimes even just a one-time session. So investigate your extended health options and figure out what's possible. Also want to let you know about a new group for abdominal pain that we're working on here. Uh, it's a cognitive behavioral group treatment uh, for children aged 8 to 12 years uh, who have recurrent abdominal pain. So it's a specific focus for kids with stomach aches. And we're running a concurrent group for parents. And it begins Tuesday, February 6th, so I think three weeks from tonight. And it's from four to five for five weeks. And so uh, we've done some groups in the past, and they've worked really well for common problems like abdominal pain. When children have stomach aches, they often think they're the only one. Or when parents are dealing with this, they think they're the only parent who has this issue. And uh, kids can learn a lot from what works for, for other kids and parents as well. So if you're interested in this group, um, please come up and talk to me uh, after the presentation. Uh, and uh, my phone number and contact information is there as well. Other resources, I've made these available at the, on the table at the back of the room if you'd like to have a peek at them before you leave. Uh, Leora Kuttner's book, A Child in Pain, How to Help, What to Do, uh, from Hartley and Marks Publishers is an excellent, excellent book. It, Dr. Kuttner really specializes in, in using imagination, and so if some of the techniques I described to you around the switch or um, you know, the magic glove appeal to you or you think they would appeal to your child, then this is an excellent book uh, for you. Another excellent book is Lonnie Zeltzer's Conquering Your Child's Pain, A Pediatrician's Guide for Reclaiming a Normal Childhood. And this book explains a lot of what I was discussing here today, the basics of how pain works, and really does a nice job from an interdisciplinary perspective. So there's chapters on medicine, uh, chapters on psycho psychological approaches, chapters on complementary and alternative approaches to pain. Uh, and uh, this is one that I recommend for, for almost all of my patients and find it very helpful myself. She's the director of a pain clinic at UCLA and they receive referrals from around the world. Another book that just came out this year that's kind of fun uh, is Imagine a Rainbow, A Child's Guide for Soothing Pain. So again, helping children to figure, ways, figure out ways that they can use their imagination to help with their pain. And there's a wonderful website uh, 
sponsored by the Hospital for Sick Children. I think this should be your number one source for health-related information um, in regards to children. It's about kids' health, so it's just www.aboutkidshealth.ca. And there is a section on pain, and it's really well done. There's great diagrams that walk you through it and, and really provides good education about what pain is. We also have a, a lot of ongoing research um, in our pediatric pain research lab here at the IWK. Many different studies for children and adolescents with various types of pain. We also often run studies where we need healthy children who don't have pain um, to help us out by learning more about children who do have pain. Uh, and so that's a phone number that you can call if you're interested in participating. And kids find that it's a really um, interesting and educational experience to participate in research that might someday help other children who have the same types of pain. So in conclusion, before we uh, open up for questions, psychological approaches can be very helpful in managing recurrent pains in children. In medicine now, there's a really strong movement that's called evidence-based practice, uh, and that the things that we do, we want research to show are effective and work. And psychological approaches are one of those treatments that is evidence-based, that the research shows is effective. We know that parents can play a major role in helping children with pain. And uh, again, you're all the experts on your child, and we have expertise in pain management strategies, so together we need to figure out what the right combination is for your child. And there are a variety of resources available, so books and also clinical services at the IWK for children with pain and their families. So you have my contact information at the back of the slide. I also have some business cards up here if anyone has questions. Uh, we also have a specific website about the research that we're doing um, and a newsletter for families who participate in our research, but you can also download it as a PDF. And we have little pain tips for children and things in the newsletter. Uh, and if you are interested in the group, if you have a child with abdominal pain, if you could please call me by the end of the week as we're starting to uh, fill up our spots there. So I'm going to uh, open it up for questions. And